<laughs> All right. I have to say, um, I thank the Lord I'm able to visit a number of camps, but I have to say this camp has the best coffee. <laughs> yep. It's a draw. Okay, is everybody ready to go? Okay, so I'm excited about this session. Um, obviously, we the Greek language, and by the way, I am, I'm not, uh, I'm a novice in the Greek language, but I, I enjoy it. Uh, if you're looking for a good book that you would like to learn Greek, I would say Bill Muntz's book on beginning Greek is excellent. He has a lot of online tools that you can use, and that's helpful. So tonight, all I want to do is kind of take one little segment and talk about Greek verbs and the color that's in Greek verbs. So when we have verbs in the English, usually there's a, there's a past tense, there's a present tense, and there's a future tense. And what we're going to see with the Greek verbs is there is voice information. There is tense information. They have a lot more uh, tenses. There's mood information, and some verbs have uh, gender information and number gen uh, information in it. So you get all this information packed into the Greek verb, which really causes the text to explode with a lot more detail, which you just don't get in the English, right? So what I'd like to do tonight is just to give you some tools to really excite you about digging deeper. Again, explore to get more. That's our, our theme for this evening. All right, so let's get started. Buckle your seat belts. Here we go. Okay, again, English verbs convey basically three senses, uh, tenses, but the Greek verbs have prefixes, infixes, um, inflexes, endings that are added to the stem. And again, they produce the mood, tense, voice, person, and number information. So let's think about the verb moods, all right? The verb moods. So um, there's seven moods. And we're, again, we're talking about um, Koine Greek, seven moods. Indicative is, is the most often used, and it, it just expresses a fact or reality. The man walked to the store. Indicative. The man walked to the store. Imperative expresses a command. You shall walk to the store. Okay? You shall walk to the store. Infinity denotes a continuous, repeated action. It's, it's a verbal noun. <coughs> there goes the walking man to the store. Walking there is a verbal adjective of the man. There goes the walking man to the store. Um, operative is to express a wish or desire. I wish all could walk to the store. Okay? Participle, I said seven moods or six. Participle, a uh, verbal adjective using a variety of ways. Um, walking is a great way to get to the store. Walking is a, a great way to get to the store. Um, a verbal adjective describing... Um, so a verbal noun, walking man. Okay, yeah. So uh, walking is a great way to get to this, the store. That would be a verbal noun. Sorry, that's infinitive. And participle is a ver verbal adjective. Um, talking about, there goes the walking man. I got those switched, all right? There goes the walking man. Walking is used there as an adjective of the man. Uh, subjunctive, an exhilaration or deliberate question. May all people walk to the store, okay? So there's six different moods there. Um, to express indicative would be the most often used, uh, expressed a fact or reality, imperative, again, a command, infinity, that's a, a verbal noun, and uh, that's um, talking about like the walking man goes to the store. That's an example of that. 
Operative is not used very often, subjunctive not as much either. Participle is used a lot, and these are verbal adjectives. Okay, so those are the moods. And then we have tenses, and there's seven tenses. So you have six moods, seven tenses. We have three tenses in the English. So here's how they work together. You have the present tense, and that's a, a tense that's often used. And it just means a progressive, ongoing uh, process or action. Future tense, which is the same way. Come on in, Vic. We're just getting started. Um, future tense is an ongoing action in the future. And that's kind of the way that we use it in the English also. But then you have a perfect tense verb. And that means that um, the action is completed and it has an enduring, um, lasting effect. Okay, it goes on and on and on. We don't have that in the English. Then we have a future perfect tense, action completed in the future with endure, uh, sorry, perfect tense, and we have a future perfect tense that sometime in the future there'll be this perfect action with enduring results. We have the imperfect tense, which means this started in the past, it continued for a time, and it stopped. Okay, and then we have eris, which is often used, it just means a simple action is completed, it's similar to the past tense in the English. And then pluperfect is, we don't see it very often. I was trying to think of an example of this, and 1 John 2, 3 came to mind. This is turned there so you can see how it's used in Scripture. 1 John 2, 3. Now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. See how it's built on something else? Something has to happen for the, the other thing to happen. And that's the idea of the pluperfect, a state that existed as a result of an action completed. Not used very often. So these are seven verb tenses. Six moods, seven tenses. In English, we have three tenses, right? Voices. You have the passive voice, you have the middle voice, and you have the active voice. So um, active means that the verb in relation to the subject, the subject's doing the action, the boy hit the ball, okay? Passive voice is, um, means that something else is acting in relation to the subject to cause the action. For example, on the cross it says, the sun was darkened. That verb is in the passive. The sun didn't darken itself. God acted on the sun to darken it. So it's saying who, who did the, re, the, the verb is related to the subject, right? In the middle voice, the subject's acting on its own behalf. The subject's acting on its own behalf. So it's active, but the subject is doing it on its own behalf. It's beneficial to the subject. And then we have um, person information, which is very similar to our English. We have first, I or we, second, you or you, plural, ye, and then third, he, she, it, they. That's very similar to the English, not much different. So let me just go through this again. We have six verb moods. Of these, I, in our, I've got five illustrations. We're going to go to Scripture and apply these. Of these, there's really only about four that are used a lot. Um, verb tenses, present tense, the aorist tense, uh, perfect tense, and perfect. Well, those would be the ones that you're used the most. And then, uh, obviously, the active voice is used a lot. Passive voice is used some. Middle voice is used less. I find the middle voice really interesting. Like I shared in the uh, intensive Bible study, when it says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to the Lord Jesus. Confess is in the middle voice, which means when 
all those unfaithful souls are lifted up out of Hades and resurrected to stand before the Lord and be judged at the great white throne judgment, they in and of themselves confess he is Lord. If God made them do it, it would be the passive voice. So that gives us some idea how glorious the Lord will be in his glorified state in heaven uh, when he reigns as judge. All right, so again, three voices, past, middle, active, and then the personage, uh, first, second, and third person is very similar to English. All right, these are two online tools. They're absolutely free that I would like to suggest that you use. My favorite is Blue Letter Bible, and what I found interesting is I've seen at least five other people here this week use that online tool. If, if I had share screen and stuff, I would use my phone and show you how to do that. It is so simple. Uh, you just use Blue Letter Bible, uh, download the app, and then you pick the text, and if you tap it, it goes over the screen. You can have interlinear information, other uh, translations, uh, dictionaries, and so forth. If you hit the interlinear, it gives you the, the English text, the Greek text, and then it'll go down and tell you each Greek word, the English equivalent, and if you touch the tools, they give you all the parsing. So it's like having a Greek and Hebrew dictionary and a lexicon all in your hand. You don't have to flip a single page. Really cool. <clears throat> okay, blueletterbible.org. Uh, That's my favorite. Easy to use. I have it on my phone. I've been using it throughout this week, actually, checking the other brothers to see if they were in error. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all right, we're going to have five little, <laughs> we have five little exercises here where we're going to uh, put to practice what we've just learned. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. I mentioned this earlier in the week, but I forgot I had this as one of the examples. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, let's see, who has a KJV here? Okay, so Andy, can you read um, verse 8, Ephesians 2.8? says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For by grace you are what? Saved. Through faith, okay? All right, um, Max, what are you reading from? New King James. All right, can you read that in the New King James? For by, gra for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift from God, okay? What was the difference? You have been saved yeah. as, as opposed to are saved. Are right, so King James has present tense, you are saved, and King James has past tense. All right, so there's two verbs here. Um, there's esta, and that is a present indicative. Indicative um, is just a statement of fact, present tense verb. But then there's also uh, sodazo, which is a perfect tense verb. It's passive, so someone else is doing the action. And if you put these two verbs together, what you find is that by grace you have been and are being saved through faith. In other words, both translations are true. You can't get to the English, though, without adding more words. And because this is a literal translation where they're trying to go one-to-one, -one, you don't add more words because then it gets long. You get something like Weiss's expanded translation of the Bible, which tries to bring out these, these different aspects. All right, so this is a case where you have a perfect tense verb. Remember, perfect, something's happened, and it's lasted forever, okay? And so when the salvation that we receive, the grace we receive through faith, is received, and it lasts forever. So we are being saved, and we have been saved. And there's a coming day that we will be saved. We'll be uh, saved from, from the earth. So let me just pause there. Any comments or questions about that? There's only one in the Blue Letter Bible. I only see one este. 
I don't see that second one in there. Right. Uh, go to the uh, go to the inner liner where it shows the whole text. So in that blue letter Bible, it'll tell you if it's in the first. So, or yeah. the so normally, that, right? yeah, you just touch that. Somewhere around. with your fingers. Okay, How come that's not working? <laughs> okay, this okay, that's is what I did. Okay, here we go. Yeah, R E. That's S D. Sorry, my neck okay. won't turn that Okay, far. sorry. Right here. Oh, that one. Yeah. Saved? Yep. That's oh, your so other verb. Saved. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry. Those are the two words there. Those are the two words. Okay. Two okay. verbs. But you see how that gives you both verbs? And just touch. Okay. If you just touch this. The, that, that thing there? It gives you all the parsing okay. at the side. That's why it's so easy. You don't have to go to a lexicon. If you just touch that that particular word, it will go over and tell you the voice, the mood, uh, all the information pertaining to that verb. That's the uh, the middle part. I don't know the letter Bible. There's like the yeah. middle part here. Touch that middle part, and then that will open up the parsing. The parsing. Okay. Um, Aren't you saying you touch, you know, on the side, on the left side where it says the Greek word, and then the English transliteration of the Greek? Well, on mine, you just, you touch? I touch the text, and it pulls up a side file, and I hit interlinear, and it has the Greek text for the verse, the English text, and then if you go down, it'll show you every Greek word, its English yeah. equivalent, and the parsing. Yeah. And then you just touch the parsing, and it pulls it up on the side and tells you what it is. Yeah. It is a great tool. What does the parsing mean? Well, that's why I'm telling you this is the information that's contained because there's influxes, subflexes, there's a lot of information on the stems. I don't have those memorized. I don't know. Probably Mercer does. You have them? No? It tells okay. You the speech, tense, mood, voice. Exactly. What person's is in. Okay. Is it? I I to keep up with the Greek study is something you have to constantly keep doing. There was a time that I kind of knew the stems, but I've just let that go because this tool's so easy, I don't have to memorize them. Okay, call me lazy, but it, it works. Okay. Okay, let's look at another one. All right, 2 Corinthians 1.10. And all of you are wanting, if you don't have a smartphone, this is a really good tool for a smartphone. All right, 2, Timoth uh, 2 Corinthians 1.10. We're going to start in verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us. What tense is that? For so great a death and does deliver us. What tense is that? Present. In whom we trust that we still, he will still deliver us. Future. And so this is one of the verses in Scripture that talk about past, present, and future salvation. Okay? Again, let's, let me review this, especially for um, just to make sure we have a good foundation. So when I acknowledge I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and I receive the gospel message, I ask God to save me. At that time, He comes in and He regenerates me. He saves my soul. He saves me from the penalty of sin, right? But then that starts a process called practical sanctification in which through faith, I'm relying on God's grace through faith, yielding to the Spirit of God. We've heard about that, mortifying uh, the deeds of flesh to the Spirit of God. I am being saved from the power of sin. That's present tense salvation. And there's a coming day when the Lord will return to the air and we'll be snatched up, and we'll get a glorified body, and we'll be saved from the presence of sin. And so, especially when you're looking at salvation, you need to be, you need to understand which tense of salvation it is, or you may come up with a bad doctrine. 
So I, I want to go through now some, just some uh, helps for this and then also some warnings, right? So, for example, in Titus 3.5, the verb saved is aorist, active, indicative. Indicative statement of fact. Um, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Who's the he there? God. God is the one doing the action. He saved us. Okay, so that's a good example of where the aorist tense lines very nicely with the past tense salvation that Paul's talking about in Titus 3.5. Let's look at Hebrews 7.25. Okay, Hebrews 7.25. Therefore... He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The pronouns there refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have that in the preceding verses. So um, in this verse, we have present tense, active. The Lord's the one doing active in infinity. It's an ongoing thing. So... Um, this, again, lines well. We have a present tense verb talking about present tense salvation. Now, Romans 5, 9. It says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And this is talking about future salvation. We don't have to go through wrath. We won't go through the tribulation period. God's people are not destined to undergo God's wrath. The Lord Jesus Christ has already undergone God's wrath for our behalf. And so in this, shall be saved, it's a future tense verb. And uh, indicative, again, a statement of fact. So this, this is nice in that the... The verb information, the tense information, is uh, upholding the context of the type of salvation that the writer is talking about. But I want to give caution here because, and this is very important, verb tense information does not overrule the context of the verse or theme of the passage. All right? It's absolutely context, context, context when you're trying to lay hold of the meaning of a passage. You need to know the context of what Paul's talking about in the immediate verses, the theme and context of the book before you make an, a conclusion. So we're in Romans 5. I just want to show you an example of this. Romans 5.10, he says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the, deeds, the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Right, so the verb shall be saved in Romans 5.10 is future, passive indicative, but the context of what Paul is saying is present tense salvation. Okay, so sometimes the verb tense information will align with the context. The point here is it's the context of the passage that overrules. Okay, because sometimes the Greek is very colorful and it can be used if you add other um, words with it to have a contextual meaning different than what its uh, particular tense information gives. Romans 10.9. This is one of my, uh, on the Romans road, this is where you get, this is the last stage of the Romans road when you're sharing the gospel with someone. If thou shalt confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, will be saved, in Romans 10, 9, is a future passive indicative. Future tense verb, indicative statement of fact, but the contents is past tense salvation. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Right? Does that make sense? 
Any questions on that? Context, context, context is, is one of the most important keys to biblical hermeneutics. The parsing is very helpful, but it doesn't, especially with the verb tenses, it doesn't overrule um, the context of the passage. So don't be led astray by that. Say, oh, here's the parsing. Uh, so it must be talking about future tense salvation. Well, here's an example where you got a future tense verb that's actually, uh, Paul's putting it as a fundamental verse of, of accepting the gospel and being saved. Yeah, Roger? That sounds counterintuitive. If you're using this tool to try and determine these things, and now you think okay, the tool is telling you that that is a future thing, you could, like you say, you could really mess up the meaning of it. But if you don't understand the context, and you try and use this tool to understand the context, you're ruined. You brought up a good point. Before you start using the, the parsing tools and the lexicon information, make sure you understand the context of the passage. What's uh, the best way to do that? Understand the context of the passage? Well, I would read, read, it, read it, it, read the whole chapter, understand the context of the book, read some commentary so you make sure that you've la you laid hold of the meaning of it, and then look into the deeper, um, the Greek information to understand the deeper, we're got, I got some examples which will show you that in a little bit. Okay, I wanted to just kind of give this as an example of caution. Okay, don't think just because I got the, the tense information, the verbs, that this is the way it must be. All right, the con it doesn't overrule the context of the passage. In other words, the writers can, it can manipulate that in such a way with other words to convey a different aspect than what the tense information has. And we do that in English, too. OK, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Um, I, Mike mentioned this in his ministry. I just want to go back to it. First Corinthians 6. I'm going to start in verse 9. He says, do you not know, by the way, that's a perfect tense verb. In other words, you should know this and keep on knowing it. That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. It's a present tense. He's saying, uh, stop being deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, will inherit, that's a future tense. It's verse 11 that I want to concentrate on. Okay, so he says, he's speaking to the Corinthians, and such were some of you. Were is imperfect. What was the, what does the imperfect tense convey? I don't know, do you have, do you have like a cheat sheet there? Somewhere. Past progressive action. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, past progressive action. Okay, the Corinthians were doing this. They were doing it because they were unsaved. They were carnal. They were dead in trespasses of sin. And they were doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And they stopped. Why did they stop? Let me tell you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, here's, here's something I think is very beautiful. You see the verb washed? Okay, that is in the middle voice. The Corinthians heard the gospel, and they made a conscious decision, I am not going to live like this anymore, I am going to, uh, I'm a sinner needing a savior. I, I'm crucified with Christ, and now I'm going to live for him. Okay? They made a conscious decision. We uh, translates this, they chose to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I've had several discussions about this with my Calvinist friends, and they have no answer to it. Because in Calvinism, it would be a passive voice. God forced them to choose. This is a middle voice, meaning that they chose for themselves. Okay? You see how important the, 
the voice information is here. Now, when it goes to sanctified and justified, who is it that sanctifies us, sets us apart in Christ, and justifies us in Christ? Who does that? God, right, in the spirit here, right? God does that. So it's a passive voice. The Corinthians didn't do that. God did that on their behalf because they chose to worship Christ, and then they were doing these nasty things. They came to Christ, and they quit doing them. And that's a lot more information than we get in the English, isn't it? See, this is the color that I'm talk telling about that comes out of the, um, the Greek verbs. Okay, let me pause there. Any, any questions on that? You mentioned, not on that, sorry, but his question. Do you have a cheat sheet? You mentioned an online book that has to be as good for the Greek. Well, Bill Munt's book on beginning Greek, I think, is excellent. It comes with a, a CD where you can download the tools. He's got a lot of helps. He actually uh, flashcards that you can learn the words. Um, and like I said, I've, I've been checking, and it was fun to see others uh, have that same app on their Bible. Mercer, were you using that too? Okay. Steve was over here in Victoria. We, he was using it throughout the week. Yeah, it's a great app. Free. Okay. Turn your Bibles to Luke 23. Um, this is, a, I think, just a wonderful example to kind of pull together a number of the things that we've been thinking through tonight about the color of Greek verbs looking at Christ's suffering on the cross. Okay, Luke 23. Everybody there? This is something I want you to, to read as we go through. And when they had come to the place called Calgary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who <clears throat> were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, this is a repentant thief, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. All right? That's that's the account of the Lord Jesus on the cross according to Luke's gospel in English. Now, let's that's, that's look through the text and, and try to apply some of these, this information that we get from the Greek verbs, and it's going to make this scene come alive in a lot more detail, okay? So, he's, the Lord Jesus is crucified between two uh, criminals, in verse 34, then Jesus said, okay, you guys have an app. Tell me, um, what is the tense for then Jesus said? Verse 34. Perfect. What's that? Imperfect. imperfect, right? What's the imperfect mean? Something happened in the past. It went on for a while. It stopped. Just like the Corinthians were sinners. They were doing all these terrible, immoral acts, and then they, they chose to be washed in the blood of Christ, and they quit. They were justified and sanctified by, by God. Imperfect. The Lord did not just say this once. 
All right? When you read like Spurgeon's uh, the seven statements of Christ from the cross, when we read it in English, it seems like the Lord Jesus just said this once. But I'm going to show you as we go through the text, he didn't say it just once. He said it over and over again for a period of time, and then he stopped, and we'll see why shortly. By the way, the word there is uh, for forgive is aphiemi. It's translated let be or suffer it in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus was not uh, extending forgiveness to those who had nailed him to the tree, as is commonly taught. That's not biblical. We're in like Luke 17, 3. If your brother uh, confesses his sin, then you, are, you must forgive him. Confess forgiveness to him. It's not a biblical principle to uh, forgive someone without them recognizing their sin and asking for it. Okay? The Lord is saying, Father, let it be. Father, suffer it. Father, don't judge it now. Afi Amy, let it be. Suffer it. Okay? Look at verse 35. The people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered. Okay, if you guys have your app there, what's the, what's the verb tense there? Isn't this fun? This app is so fun. I don't use that. I use something else. Okay, whatever. What do you got? Imperfect tense. Okay? The rulers with them sneered, imperfect, saying, he saved others, let him himself. And so you have these rulers. They're, they're looking at the Lord Jesus, and they're sneering, and they're blaspheming him. And the Lord Jesus says, Father, let it be. Father, suffer it. Father, don't judge it. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him. Verb tense? Same, Same and perfect. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. Verb tense? Same. Imperfect. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him. Word Imperfect. Do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, this is the repentant thief. What's said in verse 42? And it's also imperfect. Okay? Which word are you using? Because I, my, my program matches up with King James. Yeah, so th this is, uh, then he said in verse 42. So that's an imperfect tense. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, how about said in verse 43? He said is, is, is the same as we've been looking at. The word said, according to this, is an heiress and dignity. That's right. It's an aorist tense. All right? The verb tenses all the way through this have been in perfect and perfect and perfect until you get to the Lord's statement in verse 43. All right, so let's put this all together. The Lord is hanging on the tree. He has two malefactors on each side. Matthew says that they both were blaspheming him at the start. You have leaders, you have soldiers, pastors by, they're hurling insults up to the Lord. They're blaspheming him. They're disdaining him. He's suffering. And he has to push against the nail in his feet to get the diaphragm to lift up, for the air to come out. He makes intercession for them. Father, let it be. Father, suffer it. Father, take no action on it. Excruciating pain to make that intercession for those that were blaspheming and railing against him. He just didn't say that once. As the insults came up, the Lord, in perfect tense, was making intercession for them. That is supernatural. The repentant thief that says he's on this side, he sees how the Lord is handling this, and there comes to a point where he doesn't rail against him anymore. And the unrepentant thief, he says, save yourself and us. And it, he heaps, he's badgering the Lord with this. It goes on and on and on. The Lord doesn't say anything. The repentant thief says, listen, we're, we're 
We're being judged justly for our deeds, but this man, he's done nothing wrong. How important it is to suffer righteously and, and justly and not strike back, overcoming um, evil with good. The Lord is a perfect example on the cross. His testimony, the way he suffered, the way he made intercession, the way he didn't strike back, convinced this thief of who he was. And then he says, Lord, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Lord, which means he is acknowledging who Jesus Christ is. He's the king. He's going to come into his kingdom. He's on a cross, but he's going to come into his kingdom. Incredible faith. And so the repentant thief, seeing the way that Christ suffered patiently without opening his mouth, making intercession for those who are pressing him, it got to his conscience. He says, Lord, and he doesn't say it once. He's saying, Lord, please remember me. Lord, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord looks at him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. The Lord said it once. When the Lord says it once, that's all it needs to be said. And it is a rock bed truth. Now, that scene it, with the Greek verbs, the color of the Greek verbs, doesn't that make it come out a lot? That's something we don't get in the English at all, is it? And I think that one of the blessings of this is to see the way that our Savior behaved and the power of not striking back, the power of being in the will of the Father no matter what the cost, loving, showing compassion to those that are hurt. It, it gets to their conscience. And this man turned to the Lord, even nailed on the cross because of the Lord, the way he suffered. Isn't that great? Okay, so that's, that's an example um, I think it's a really good one just to show kind of how the, the, the Greek verbs provide so much color into the text. So let me just pause there. Comments, questions. Um, those of you who have some Greek knowledge, if you want to share more, that's great. By the way, verse 40, 45, the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Darkened there is passive. Something acted on the sun in order to darken it. I think God did it. So, I, does, was this too hard? I mean, is this um, understandable? I yeah. Think, like I've got after you explain it that way, I've got a vision like uh, directing a movie and seeing it, you know, <laughs> getting all the crowd to do the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Jesus would have been the cross. Like it's making it come alive. Like yeah. I'm making notes down here because it's going to make a great sermon. <laughs> 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 and then you just said it just once. Boom. Yeah. Done. I used a complete word study Bible from AMG. And I used to go into the grammar quite a bit. But I found out that I don't know Greek well enough. So I've stayed away from it generally because I don't want to mess up too much. Because I just don't know Greek. Yeah, I find, uh, I like Weiss's expanded translation. I think it is based on the critical text, but it still is a nice way of understanding the Greek words and how they, they play together. I'm not a Greek expert either. I just love that this is the language of the New Testament. And so if we want to understand, explore to get more, we're going to have to have a basic understanding at least of the original language. You don't have to be a Greek expert to... Uh, appreciate it. However, the caution is don't don't um, come forth and preaching um, something that you've gotten from the Greek unless you're not sure about it because you don't want to propagate it, something that's wrong. Since I know nothing, I really stay away from it now than what mm -hmm. I used to do. Let me uh, flip back to uh, Ephesians. Let's look, I'll just show you something else why this kind of information is important. Ephesians 2. Okay, so we looked at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, this is a battleground verse for reformers. 
those in Reformed theology, what would they say is the gift of God? Faith. 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 You have to, there's irresistible grace, and when you hear uh, the, the gospel, God gives you the faith to believe that. Irresistible, right? But if you look at grace, now this is getting into the noun uh, components of the Greek. Um, when you start looking at case and number and gender information for nouns, um, it's interesting that grace is feminine, faith is feminine, it's genitive feminine, but gift is neuter. So for um, the gift to relate to grace and faith, it would have to be the same case, number, and gender, and it's not. So the Greek here tells us that, no, faith is not the gift. Okay, the gift is the salvation that is given. And that's received by grace through faith. Okay, so that, that's some of the information that you can get. Uh, if you don't know these things, sometimes you can develop false doctrines and say, well, uh, God gives us the faith. That's the gift. Well, not according to the Greek text. Let me just see if I understood that. Um, are you saying that the gift of God is not even referencing the word grace? It's, word, it's referencing the salvation. Salvation, yeah. The gift is a salvation. How is it received? Um, by grace through faith. Psalms G, 1537. <laughs> <All right. coughs> oh, but that's a nice... Um, I'm glad you did that, Roger. Because if you want to know what the word sounds like in the Greek, you just hit it and it'll pronounce it for you. Uh, you can even have the thing read the Strong's concordance number and tell you what the meaning of the word. It's a really powerful app. It's all like all in one. You can get the dictionary. You can get um, pronunciation helps. You can get the parsing, um, and it's free. Or what I've been doing recently with that app is um, I put it. There's a there's a feature in there where it will read the Bible to you. Yes, I do that too. And then you can follow down your own Bible, so you're getting it through your eyes and through your ears at yes. the same time. And of course, we know that just the general reading of it is going to give us the context of it. And you can even hit the scroll button and it will automatically scroll down. You don't just sit there and read, don't even have oh, yeah, to touch it. Well. <laughs> yeah. I got uh, trouble with that is I was two weeks away from internet connection this year. Yes. And all this stuff was useless to me, so fortunately I have this downloaded into my tablet so I can still go to it. Yeah, so that's a good point, Sandy. This app, you can read the Bible, um, like on an airplane or something like that. I, I'll read the Bible on my phone, but you don't get all the online tools unless you have Wi-Fi. Okay. So that's a good point. Mercer, I know you've done a, quite a bit of studying in this area. Anything you want to add or... It brings it out. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Are they not being deceptive of some of the Calvinists now by not disclosing that the genders have to match? Well, that's that's a foundational rule in Greek that when you're looking at nouns and pronouns, the case, gender, and number information needs to match to um, make that connection. You know, so. When the Greeks were talking about it, they knew the, the case information tells you um, what's the object, the subject of the verb, the direct object, and so the genitive, what, who, who owns what or pertains to what. And so that information was all in the Greek. You, you know, I, when I was in grammar school, sometimes they make you diagram sentences, direct object, indirect object, subject. I hated it. Uh, but the Greek, all that information is tucked into the case information. So would this not solve the problem of the confession of Peter and Jesus that upon this rock? Yeah, absolutely. So that solves that. that yeah, well, let's take a look at that. that verb, people say it can go either way. No, 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 no. Let's look at that. Matthew 16. Okay, so um, this is the first mention of the church. 
the Lord says, and I also, now Peter's made this profession in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros, masculine, and on this rock, so on this profession, I will build my church. Okay, rock there is Petra feminine. So I can tell you categorically that these are two different things. Peter is not the rock. The Peter is a Petros is small, and then there was this foundational rock. Feminine, Petros is masculine. Not the same thing, absolutely. So. This is an example where if you do have some Greek knowledge, you can dispose some of these false teachings. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, I, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say I'm just glad that God, in his preparation for the Lord coming, made Greek in the common language, the lingua franca, of the world and with the New Testament, I'm glad he didn't do Hebrew. Yes. <laughs> because it's a big, yes. uh, a lot different. Yeah, not nearly as colorful. I heard it's difficult because I've met some Jewish ladies, but you had to learn the uh, Jewish alphabet, and it's pretty difficult. Well, I wanted to, uh, in my session, just by holding the Lord Jesus up like that, so you could just see and, and adore him more and be more appreciative of what he did at Calvary. And, uh, the whole idea of this is not to cram our brains with knowledge, per se, but to um, use some tools to better understand Scripture and what the Father wants us to understand about his Son and uh, be able to appreciate him more. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that's, uh, this has been a fruitful exercise. Again, this PPT, uh, it's on the laptop there. Um, and it, if you want a copy of it, I'm very happy to give it to you. This is only such a really small segment of hermeneutic studies that we've gone through tonight, but I think it's a good place to start. Father, I just thank you for our time today. It's been quite lovely. All week has been quite lovely. We thank you for the great spirit of unity there's been. Uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, we've come tonight with uh, the intention of encouraging one another, learning more, uh, learning how to um, be more faithful, to serve you, to encourage each other. And to that extent, I pray that you would just greatly bless the, the rest of this part two of digging deeper, the intensive uh, part. Pray, Father, that you would just bless each one that's come. Thank you for bringing... Uh, those from afar, thank you for Vic and his company at Vista Rye. We thank you for their safety. And I pray, Father, for my brothers Mike and Mercer tomorrow as they open the word and have these important topics that you would just bless them and that there would just be this edification and building up that when we everyone leaves tomorrow would say that was so profitable and so worthwhile.